Hello, watchers and hopefully readers. For the 2022 Senior School Book Week, at the suggestion of your librarian, Ms. Wallace, I have picked a text, I have rebridged it from Philip K. Dick, the American science fiction writer. It's called, it's a speech he gave at a university, uh, which is called How to Build a Universe That Doesn't Fall Apart Two Days Later. He gave this speech in 1978. But first, let's have a look at the first paragraph of Philip K. Dick's Wikipedia page. So, PKD, as I call him, 1928-1982, died quite young, was an American science fiction writer. He wrote 44 novels and about 121 short stories, most of which appeared in science fiction magazines during his lifetime. His fiction explored varied philosophical and social questions, such as the nature of reality, perception, human nature and identity, and commonly featured characters struggling against elements such as alternate realities, illusory environments, monopolistic corporation, drug abuse, authoritarian governments, and altered state of consciousness. So as you can imagine, this is very much my jam. PKD also is very much beloved of the film and TV industry with many an adaptation, Minority Report, Total Recall, original remake, Blade Runner, original and remake, and it's kind of darkly, probably my favorite adaptation. Um, yeah, uh, so that was written more than 40 years ago, but as you'll see, it, it is as relevant and salient as it ever was. Here we go. How to build a universe that doesn't fall apart two days later. Science fiction writers, I am sorry to say, really do not know anything. We can't talk about science because our knowledge of it is limited and unofficial, and usually our fiction is dreadful. A few years ago, no college or university would ever have considered inviting one of us to speak. We were mercifully confined to lurid pulp magazines, impressing no one. In those days, friends would say to me, but are you writing anything serious? Meaning, are you writing anything other than science fiction? We longed to be accepted. We yearned to be noticed. Then suddenly the academic world noticed us. We were invited to give speeches and appear on panels. And immediately we made idiots of ourselves. The problem is simply this. What does a science fiction writer know about? On what topic is he an authority? Well, I will tell you what interests me, what I consider important. I can't claim to be an authority on anything, but I can honestly say that certain matters absolutely fascinate me and that I write about them all the time. The two basic topics which fascinate me are what is reality and what constitutes the authentic human being. Over the 27 years in which I have published novels and stories, I have investigated these two interrelated topics over and over again. I consider them important topics. What are we? What is it which surrounds us that we call the not me or the empirical or phenomenal world? In 1951, when I sold my first story, I had no idea that such fundamental issues could be pursued in the science fiction field. I began to pursue, pursue them unconsciously. My first story had to do with a dog who imagined that the garbage men who came every Friday morning were stealing valuable food which the family had carefully stored away in a safe metal container. Every day, members of the family carried out paper sacks of nice ripe food, stuffed them into the metal container, shut the lid tightly, and when the container was full, these dreadful looking creatures came and stole everything but the can. Finally, in the story, the dog begins to imagine that someday the garbage men will eat the people in the house, as well as stealing their food. Of course, the dog is wrong about this. We all know that garbage men do not eat people. But the dog's extrapolation was in a sense logical, given the facts at his disposal. The story was about a real dog, and I used to watch him and try to get inside his head and imagine how he saw the world. Certainly, I decided that dog sees the world quite differently than I do or any humans do. And then I began to think, maybe each human being lives in a unique world, a private world, a world different from those inhabited and experienced by all other humans. And that led me wonder, if reality differs from person to person, can we speak of reality singular, or shouldn't we really be talking about plural realities? And if there are plural realities, are some more true 
more real than others? What about the world of a schizophrenic? Maybe it's as real as our world. Maybe we cannot say that we are in touch with reality and he is not. But should instead say, his reality is so different from ours that he can't explain his to us and we can't explain ours to him. The problem then is that if subjective worlds are experienced too differently, there occurs a breakdown in communication and there is the real illness. I once wrote a story about a man who was injured and taken to a hospital. When they began surgery on him, they discovered that he was an android, not a human, but that he did not know it. They had to break the news to him. Almost as once, Mr. Garson Poole discovered that his reality consisted of a punched tape passing from reel to reel in his chest. Fascinated, he began to fill in some of the punched holes and add new ones. Immediately, his world changed. A flock of ducks flew, flew through the room when he punched one new hole in the tape. Finally, he cut the tape entirely, whereupon the world disappeared. However, it also disappeared for the other characters in the story, which makes no sense if you think about it, unless the other characters were figments of its punched tape fantasy, which I guess is what they were. It was always my hope in writing novels and stories which asked the question, what is reality, to someday get an answer. This was the hope of most of my readers too. Years passed. I wrote over 30 novels and over 100 stories, and still I could not figure out what was real. One day, a girl college student in Canada asked me to define reality for her for a paper she was writing for a philosophy class. She wanted a one-sentence answer. I thought about it and finally said, reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. That's all I could come up with. That was back in 1972. Since then, I haven't been able to define reality any more lucidly. But the problem is a real one, not a mere intellectual game, because today we live in a society in which spurious realities are manufactured by the media, by governments, by big corporations, by religious groups, political groups, and the electronic hardware exists by which to deliver these pseudo-worlds right into the head of the reader, the viewer, the listener. So I ask in my writing, what is real? Because unceasingly we are bombarded with pseudo-realities manufactured by very sophisticated people using very sophisticated electronic mechanisms. I do not distrust their motives. I distrust their power. They have a lot of it. And it is an astonishing power, that of creating whole universes, universes of the mind. I ought to know. I do the same thing. It is my job to create universes as the basis of one novel after another. And I have to build them in such a way that they do not fall apart two days later. Or at least that is why my editors hope. However, I will reveal a secret to you. I like to build universes which do fall apart. I like to see them come unglued. And I like to see how the characters in the novels cope with this problem. I have a secret love of chaos. There should be more of it. Do not believe, and I am dead serious when I say this, do not assume that order and stability are always good in a society or in a universe. The old, the ossified, must always give way to new life and the birth of new thing. Before the new things can be born, the old must perish. This is a dangerous realization because it tells us that we must eventually part with much of what is familiar to us. And that hurts, but that is part of the script of life. Unless we can psychologically accommodate change, we ourselves begin to die inwardly. What I am saying is that objects, custom, habits, and ways of life must perish so that the authentic human being can live. And it is the authentic human being who matters most, the viable, elastic organism which can bounce back, absorb, and deal with the new. I consider the matter of defining what is real to be a serious topic, even a vital topic. And in there somewhere is the other topic, the definition of the authentic human, because the bombardment of pseudo-realities begin to produce inauthentic humans very quickly, spurious humans as fake as the data pressing at them from all sides. My two topics are really one topics. They unite at this point. Fake realities will create fake humans, or fake humans will generate fake realities and then sell them to other humans, turning them eventually into forged of themselves. 
The basic tool for the manipulation of reality is the manipulation of words. If you can control the meaning of words, you can control the people who must use the words. George Orwell made this clear in his novel 1984. But another way to control the minds of people is to control their perceptions. If you can get them to see the world as you do, they will think as you do. Comprehension follows perception. How do you get them to see the reality you see? After all, it is only one reality out of many. Images are basic constituent pictures. And, and I say this as a professional fiction writer. The producer, scriptwriters, and directors who create these video slash audio worlds do not know how much of their content is true. In other words, they are victims of their own products along with us. Speaking for myself, I do not know how much of my writing is true or which parts, if any, are true. This is a potentially lethal situation. We have fiction mimicking truth and truth mimicking fiction. We have a dangerous overlap, a dangerous blur, and in all probability, it is not deliberate. In fact, that is part of the problem. You cannot legislate an offer into correctly labeling his product, like a can of pudding whose ingredients are listed on the label. You cannot compel him to declare what part is true and what isn't, if he himself does not know. This was heavily abridged. You will find it uh, on the internet. You can Google it, Philip K. Dick, How to Build a Universe That Doesn't Fall Apart Two Days Later. Um, I think, yeah, I, I don't particularly need to uh, labor the point that he was mostly referring to television at the time, right, in the late 70s. But now with um, internet and social media, it's as true as it ever was, uh, probably more. <laughs>